<clears throat> Alright, well, here we are. Uh, this is episode uh, 55 of Calling Sacred Cows. Uh, this one, we're going to have a little morning coffee. A little uh, central nervous system stimulant. And we're going to begin by going through the Iliad. Or rather, we're going to begin by going through the Iliad after I've had a little bit of a a rant. So just like normal Thursday night, Friday morning stuff. Okay. So the subject of the Iliad is... Um, Book 3, lines 187 and following. And it will just go a little while until we wind up running out of time. But before we get to that, I have a little something to share about uh, yesterday. Yesterday was an amazing day in that I went for a longer bike ride than I've uh, gone for in quite some time. And I've noticed that when I do that, when, when, I, when I go for, uh, not necessarily riding any faster than I would have intended, but I go for longer, uh, that, that um, it's completely possible to overdo it. But if you don't, you wind up having this pleasantly exhausted feeling. And that pleasantly exhausted feeling helps you to get a much higher quality of sleep. So, I was just thinking that I would uh, very, very highly recommend uh, doing that. It just, it feels really good. It uh, also helps improve insulin sensitivity among many other things and I think that I'm going to wind up needing to integrate into my own a routine more periodic longer bike rides longer runs and the like um, so I'm just being a be, being a spokesperson for a little bit longer exercise I it wasn't it wasn't crazy long it was only like 32 kilometers total but still um, it's, it's, it's longer than my usual commutes. It's longer than my usual exercise routes. It's longer than what I ordinarily make time for. And uh, it wound up being a special event because I actually had to set aside time uh, to go cycling with a friend in order to accomplish it. But it was, um, it was definitely worth it. I mean, that, that wouldn't have been anything big for me a decade ago. In fact, it would have probably just been a normal, normal bike ride that I wouldn't have thought too much about. But once, now that I go and reflect back on it, now that I go and reflect back on what my bike rides were like a decade ago, I was almost always pleasantly exhausted at the end. And that, that, um, I'd say it probably had a very good impact on my well-being. So, if you find me being somehow weird or different than it than I have been uh, in the past during the stream, it's probably due to the fact that I'm feeling better. Uh, if you find me just acting like a weirdo, it's probably because I'm way more mellow. I'm way less wound up. And I'm not experiencing any racing thoughts this morning. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So, there we go. Oh, hello, James. It's good to see you. Hello, uh, three other people that are here. And hello, anybody else that happens to be watching this after the fact. Welcome. We're going to get right, uh, right into what it was we were setting out to do. And I'll start reading. From the Iliad, Book 3, lines 187 and following. 
So they among themselves, but Priam called, Fair Helen to his side, my daughter dear, Come sit beside me, thou shalt hence discern, Thy former lord, thy kindred, and thy friends. I charge no blame on thee the gods have caused, Not thou this lamentable war to Troy. Name to me yon Achaean chief for bulk, Conspicuous and for port, taller indeed. I may perceive than he, but with these eyes saw never yet such dignity and grace. Declare his name, some royal chief he seems, to whom thus Helen, loveliest of her sex, my other sire by me forever held, in reverence and with filial fear beloved. Oh, that some cruel death had been my choice, rather than to abandon as I did. All joys domestic, matrimonial bliss. Brethren, dear daughter, and companions dear. A wanderer with thy son, yet I, alas, Died not, and therefore now live but to weep. But I resolve thee, thou beholdest the son Of Atreus, Agamemnon, mighty king, In arms heroic, gracious in the throne, And though it shame me now to call him such, by nuptial ties a brother once to me. Then him the ancient king admiring said, O blessed Atreides, happy was thy birth, And thy lot glorious whom this gallant host, So numerous of the sons of Greece obey. To vine-vamed Phrygia in my days of youth, I journeyed, many Phrygians there I saw, Brave horsemen and expert they were the powers of Otreus and Migdon, godlike chief, and on the banks of Sangar's stream encamped, I marched among them, chosen in that war, ally of Phrygia, and it was her day, of conflict with the man-defying race, the Amazons, yet multitudes like these, thy bright-eyed Greeks I saw not even there. The venerable king observed next, Observing next, Ulysses thus inquired, My child, declare. Him also, shorter by the head he seems, Than Agamemnon, Atreus' mighty son. But shoulder, broader, and of ampler chest, He hath disposed his armor on the plain. But like a ram himself the warrior ranks, Ranges majestic like a ram full fleeced, by numerous sheep, encompassed snowy white. To whom Jove's daughter Helen thus replied, In him the son of old Laertes know, Ulysses born in Ithaca the rude, But of a piercing wit and deeply wise. Then answer thus, Antenor sage returned, Princess, thou hast described him hither once, the noble Ithacan on thy behalf, Ambassador with Menelaus came, Beneath my roof with hospitable fare, Friendly I entertained them, seeing them, Seeing then occasion opportune I closely marked, The genius and the talents of the chiefs. And this I noted well, that when they stood, Amid the assembled counselors of Troy, Then Menelaus his advantage showed, who by the shoulders overtopped his friend. But when both sat Ulysses in his air, had more of state and dignity than he, in the delivery of the speech addressed, to the full senate Menelaus used, few words, but to the matter fitly ranged, and with much sweetness uttered for in loose, and idle play of ostentatious terms, he dealt not, though he were the younger man. But when the wise Ulysses from his seat Had once arisen, he would his downcast eyes So rivet on the earth and with a hand That seemed untutored in its use so hold, His scepter swaying it to neither side, That hast thou seen him, thou hast thought him sure. Some chafed and angry idiot passion fixed. Yet when at length the clear and mellow bass 
of his deep voice break forth and he let fall his chosen words like flakes of feathered snow none then might match ulysses leisure then found none to wander at his noble form the third of whom the venerable king inquired was ajax yon achaean tall whose head and shoulders tower above the rest and of such bulk prodigious who is he him answered helen loveliest of her sex a bulwark of the greeks in him thou seest gigantic ajax opposite appear the cretans and among the chiefs of crete stands like a god idomenus him oft from crete arrived was menelaus wont to entertain and others now i see achaeans whom i could recall to mind and give to each his name but two brave youths i yet discern not for equestrian skill one famed and one a boxer never foiled my brothers born of leda sons of jove castor and pollux either they abide in lovely sparta still or if they came Decline the fight by my disgrace abashed, and the reproaches which have fallen on me. She said, but they already slept, inhumed, in Lacedaemon in their native soil. And now, the heralds through the streets of Troy charged with the lambs and with a goat skin filled with heart exhilarating wine prepared for that divine solemnity returned Idaeus in his hand a beaker bore resplendent with its fellow cups of gold and thus he summoned ancient Priam forth son of Lamedon arise the chiefs call thee the chiefs of Ilium and of Greece descend into the plain we strike a truce and need thine oath to bind it paris fights with warlike menelaus for his spouse their spears decide the strife the conqueror wins helen and all her treasures we thenceforth peace sworn in amity shall dwell secure in troy while they to argos shall return and to Achaia praised for women fair. He spake, and Priam shuddering bade his train prepare his steeds, they sedulous obeyed. First Priam mounting backward stretched the reins, and Tenor next beside him sat and threw. The Saian gate they drove into the plain, arriving at the hosts of Greece and Troy. They left the chariot and proceeded both into the interval between the hosts. Then uprose Agamemnon and uprose. All wise Ulysses next the heralds came, conspicuous forward expediting each. The ceremonial they the beaker filled with wine into the hands of all the kings ministered water Agamemnon then drawing his dagger which he ever bore a pendant to his heavy falcon's sheath cut off the forelocks of the lambs of which the heralds gave to every grecian chief a portion and to all the chiefs of troy then agamemnon raised his hands and prayed jove father whom from ida stretchest forth thine arm omnipotent grueling all and thou all seeing and all hearing sun ye rivers earth or and thou conscious earth and ye who under earth on humankind avenge severe the guilt of violated oaths hear ye and ratify what now we swear should Paris slay the hero amber-haired, my brother Menelaus, Helen's wealth, and Helen's self are his and all our host, 
shall home return to Greece, but should it chance, that Paris fall by Menelaus' hand, then Troy shall render back what she detains, with such immersement as is meet a sum, to be remembered in all future times, which penalty should Priam and his sons not pay, though Paris fall, then here in arms. I will contend for payment of the mulch, my due till satisfied I close the war. He said, and with his ruthless steel the lambs stretched painting all, but soon they ceased to pant. For mortal was the stroke, then drawing forth 